السلام علیك يا فاطمة فقلت عليك السلام قال إني أجد في بدني زعوفا فقلت لا إزك بالله يا أبطاه من الزعوفة فقال يا فاطمة إتني بالكساء اليماني فقد تني بيفاتيته بالكساء اليماني وقد تيته بيفسرت أنظر إلهي وإزا وجهه يتلا لو كانه بدر في ليلة تماومه وكماله فما كانت إلا ساعة وإزا ببلدي الحسن قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمه فقلت وليك السلام يا قرطائني وسمرت فواضي فقال يا أمه إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كانها رائحة جد رسول الله فقلت نامنا جدك تحت الكساء فأقبل الحسن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جده يا رسول الله يا تازنوني أنا أدخل ما أقى تحت الكساء فقال وليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوزي قد أزنت لك بداخل ما هو تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا سعوت وإزا بولدي الحسين قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمه فقلت وليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرط عيني والسمرة فباودي فقال لي يا أمه إني أشمب عندك رائحة طيبة كأنه رائحة جد رسول الله فقلت نامنا جدك وخاك تحت الكساء فدن الحسين نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جده السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله أتعزنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال وليك السلام يا والدي ويا شاف يا أمتي قد أزنت لك فدخل معهما تحت الكساء فأقبل عند ذلك أبو الحسن علي بن أبي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت وليك السلام يا أب الحسن ويا أمير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمة إني أشمب عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة أخي وابن أمي رسول الله فقلت نعم ها هو ما والدك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتعزنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال وليك السلام يا أخي ويا وسي وخليفتي وصحب الباي قد أزنت لك فدا خلالي تحت الكساء ثم أتعت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا أبتاه يا رسول الله أتعزنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال وليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بزأتي قد أزنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء فلم اقتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء أخذ أبي رسول الله بترفي الكساء وعم ياد اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم إن حول أحل بيتي وخاستي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يولمني ما يولمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا هرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لما صالمهم وعدو لما نعدهم ومحبا لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فجأل سلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورزوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم رئيسا وطائرهم تطهيرا صلي على أمه فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكة ويا سكان السماوات إني ما خلقت السماء مبنية ولا عرض مدهيتا ولا كمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مزيتا ولا فلقا يدورا ولا بحر يجري ولا فلقا يسري إلا في محبة حولا إلا خمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء 
فقال لامین و جبرائیل یا رب و من تحت القصائے فقال عز و جلہم اہل و بیت النبوہ و مادن الرسالہم فاطمت و عبوہ و بالوہ و بنوہ فقال جبرائیل یا رب آتا زنولی انہ بطول الارض لیاکون ما آہم صادسا فقال اللہ نام قد ازنت لقفہ بطل آمین و جبرائیل وقال السلام علیکہ یا رسول اللہ العلی العلاو یکراوکا السلام و یخصوکا بالتحییت والاکرام و یکولو لکا و عزتی و جلالی انی ما خلقت السماء مبنیہ ولا ارض ہم مدیت ہوں ولا کمرا منیرہ ولا شمس ہم مزیت ہوں ولا فلق ہم یدور ہو ولا بحر ہم یجری ولا فلق ہم یسری اللہ لے اجلکم و محبتکم و قادا زنالی انعد خلام آکم فالتا زنونی یا رسول اللہ فقال رسول اللہ ولیک السلام یا آمین و وحی اللہ انہو نام قد ازن تولا قفا داخلا جبرائیل و معاونا تحت القصاوے فقال لے عبی ان اللہ کا دعا الائکم یقولو انما یرید اللہ لیجد حبانکم رسح للبائت و یتاہرکم تتہیراو فقال علی لے عبی یا رسول اللہ اخبرنی ما لے جلو سنا حاضا تحت القصاوے من الفضل عند اللہ فقال النبی صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ واللذی باوسنی بالحق نبی مستفانی بالرسالہ نجی اما ذکر خبرنا حوز فی محفل من محافل علی الارض و فیہ جم من شیعتنا و محبین اللہ و نزلت علیہم الرحمت و حفت بہم الملائکت و استغفرت لحم الائی تفرکو فقال علیون علیہ السلام ازم واللہ فزنا و فاز شیعتنا و رب القعوبا فقال ابی رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ یا علی واللذی باوسنی بالحق نبی مستفانی بالرسالہ نجی اما ذکر خبرنا حاضا فی محفل من محفل اہل الارض و فیہ جم من شیعتنا و محبینا وَفِيهِمْ مَحْمُومٍ إِلَّا وَفَرَجَ اللَّهُ هَمَّهُ وَلَا مَحْمُومٍ إِلَّا وَكَشَفَ اللَّهُ غَمَّهُ وَلَا تَعْلِبَ حَاجَةٍ إِلَّا وَكَزَى اللَّهُ حَاجَةٍ فَقَالَ عَلِيُّنَ لَهِ السَّلَامِ اِذَنْ وَاللَّهُ فُزْنَا وَسُعِدْنَا وَقَزَى لِكَ شِيَّتُنَا فَعَزُوا وَسُعِدُوا فِي الدُّنْيَا نامِ عباسِ وسیلہ نامِ عباسِ وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کے لیے نامِ عباسِ وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کیلئے اس میں آزم ہے یہ مومن کی التجا کیلئے نام عباس سے وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کیلئے کوئی مانے یہ نہ مانے چشمہِ فیس ہے یہ در رکتان کے لیے چشمہِ فیس ہے یہ در رکتان کے لیے نامِ عباس وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کے لیے 
نام آباز وسیلا ہے ہر دعا کے لیے دید کرتا ہو علم پر تو سانس رکھتا ہے یاد آجاتا ہے یہ گازی مجھے یوں لگتا ہے اب بھی روتا یہ یہ زینب تیری رضا کے لیے اب بھی روتا ہے یہ زینب تیری رضا کے لیے نام ابا سے وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کے لیے نام ابا سے وسیلہ ہے ہر دعا کے لیے اس میں آزم ہے یہ مومن کی التجا کے لیے Salat. Salat. Oh, Akbar. Oh, Akbar. Oh, Akbar. Do you realize what you're asking me for? You are asking your father for permission to let you become a martyr in the state of loss. How do I let you go? In this land of calamities, how do I let you go? In a time of pure devastation, how do I let you go? Oh, my beloved child, are you really asking me for permission to let you become a martyr? You are asking your father for permission to let you become a martyr. Oh, Akbar, do you realize what you're asking me for? You are asking your father for permission to let you become a martyr. Before you asked, did you not consider what will happen to your father's heart? Uh, oh, my beloved son, Ali Akbar, did you not think of this? That I will pass away if I am separated from you. You are asking me to separate myself from old age. You are asking your father for permission to let you become a martyr. Oh, Akbar, do you realize what you're asking me for? Oh, Akbar, oh, Akbar, oh, Akbar, Salat. سلوات بر محمد و آل محمد آسو زہرا کی یتیمی پہ بہاؤ سو زہرا کی یتیمی پہ بہاؤ لوگو آسو زہرا کی یتیمی پہ بہاؤ غم ایسا محمد کا بچھاؤ لوگو 
سلوات بر محمد و آل محمد اللهم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد پیکابر اس رہی ہے تابوت پر حسن کے
زیناب ہے بال کھولے امد ہے تیر تولے زیناب ہے بال کھولے امد ہے تیر تولے پوچھو نہ شام کی جب یہ حال ہے وطن کے پیکان برس رہے ہیں تابوت پر حسن کے تابوت سے لپٹ کے خاصم پکار بابا تابوت سے لپٹ کے خاصم پکار بابا آسو اخی کے دیکھو نوحے سنو پہن کے پیکان برس رہے ہیں تابوت پر حسن کے سائے میں مرتضی کے بچڑے تھے فاطمہ سے سائے میں مرتضی کے بچڑے تھے فاطمہ سے اور آج پاس ماں کے آئے ہیں ہلاش بن کے پیکان برس رہے ہیں تابوت پر حسن کے امد مٹا رہی ہے آسار پنجتن کے پیکان برس رہی ہے تابوت پر حسن کے سلوات برہ محمد والے I would request Maulana Sheikh Bilal Hussain to please come and recite tonight's majlis, inshallah. Salwaat bar Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. رحم الله من يقرأ سورة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفكه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
Your second salawat of love for love of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And your loudest salawat is condolences to the master of our time, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. May Allah increase in our reward for commemorating the difficulties of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Tonight marks the 28th of the month of Safar, which is associated with the shahadat of both our Prophet and our second Imam. First and foremost, in some communities we find there's a difference in some of the dates that some communities commemorate these dates differently, that for example, one of the dates that's famously known for the shahadat of our second imam is the seventh of Safar in some communities. Uh, some communities, for example, commemorate the shahadat of Imam Raza tomorrow, some do it on the 17th of Safar, and some still do it on a third date. These dates and the fact that we find differences in them is not a complication for us, is not a problem for us. Uh, one of my teachers, he makes a point, he says that the only date that we're ever sure of in history is the date that's written in blood. It, the meaning of that statement is when, for example, there is a battle or, for example, there is an attack on a person that the date is noted that their blood was spilled on this date is where we are certain of the tarikh. Which is why you'll see there's never a debate about what day was it that Imam Hussein was shaheed. You won't find a debate about the date that Imam Ali was shaheed. These dates that were written in blood by an event where the spilling of the blood occurred is something that we're confident of. Other than that, these other dates we find we don't always know and there's some difference in these. There's no problem with there being a difference in dates. Why? Because the purpose of the date is to connect with the wasila of the person. The ahmiyat is the person, not the day. The ahmiyat is the person who we want to get closer to. So whether I have a day on which I commemorate him, which is one day, or I commemorate him on a different day, the idea is, is that my goal is that through the concept of aza, that my connection to that person gets stronger. Not that that day is the one that's the most significant for me. So in these ways we know that even if there are some differences in these dates and these understandings, there's no problem with it. We'll again split our discussion into two parts of our discussion. In the first part of our discussion, we'll return back to some of the ahkam and some of the points that are important for us to learn about. With your loudest of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the questions that sometimes happens is, is that, for example, I have a deceased relative who is maybe in Pakistan, in India, in Africa, Iraq, somewhere else, and I'm sitting in America. Or I'm in Atlanta and my relative is in New York. Does my Fatiha reach this person? The explanation for this is that yes, the Fatiha reaches the person because of the difference between the soul and the body. You see, when a human being is alive and the soul is attached to the body, the senses of the soul are limited to the senses of the body. Meaning that for me to hear someone, they need to be in a range that my ear can hear them. For me to see someone, they have to be in range of my eyes to see them. Once they go outside, when they say something, they look at something, I can't see them. The faculties of the soul are different. When we want to understand the faculties of the soul, the senses of the soul are much broader. To the extent where someone asked our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, about does the soul, is the soul, if it's in a different land, is it aware when we recite Fatiha? And the Imam explains, he says, the soul's understanding of this earth is different than the understanding of the body. The soul can be aware of this entire earth and who is on it at any given point in time without a restriction of time and space. Meaning that you don't have to be at the same exact point in the same exact time zone. You can be in different places around the earth and the impact and the benefit reaches. It's, for example, the idea that they can see the earth. The soul is aware of the earth the way we are aware of a tennis ball. You can hold it in your hand and you can see the entire thing at once. So the imam says, wherever in this world that you are, when you recite a fatiha, the person that you are reciting it for is aware of it. Which is why, even for us, when we sit here and we do the ziyarat of the imam, we're certain that the imam receives the ziyarat. 
When we send salam to the imam, we're certain the imam receives the salam. Because the imam's awareness of the people on this earth is far more encompassing than that of a person whose senses are limited. The description of this discussion gets very lengthy and gets into a very philosophical discussion that inshallah may Allah give us tawfiq, we'll discuss at some point in time. But the idea is, is that one, it's beneficial that even if I can't see the grave, I can't go to the grave, I should recite Fatiha for them and remember them and they will know and they will receive the benefit. Two, it is beneficial to go to the grave of a person and to visit them. From the one aspect, it's beneficial for me as an individual. Why? We have the narrations of our Prophet. He says, Alaykum bihadim al I enjoin upon you to participate in the destroyer of desires. Hadim al The one that destroys your desires. And they asked, Ya Rasulullah, wa ma What is that? He says, Ziyarat al kubur The visiting of the graves. Is something that when you get lost in this world and you get caught up in these material benefits, the thing to control your nafs and your desires that's beneficial for you is to visit the graves. When you visit the graves, it will help limit your desires for this world because you'll see, one day I am here, tomorrow I'll be in the ground. I'll realize that all of these things that I'm chasing after, what's the benefit? And it's one of the beneficial things to do. And as such, as visiting the graves is a good thing to do, there are times that are beneficial for us to visit the graves. From the riwayat of the Ahlul Bayt, there are certain times that we have learned are beneficial when we can visit the grave and it is the most mustahab. Now, it doesn't mean that if I'm not going to the grave at this time, I shouldn't go. That's not what the meaning of this is. But rather that if I can make it a priority at these times to be present and to visit at these times, I should make it a priority to incorporate into my activities to visit the graves at these times. The times that are listed, that Monday, the entire day of Monday from Fajr until Maghrib is one of the recommended days to go and visit the graveyard. Thursdays is also another day that the day of Thursday is a day that's recommended. It's mustahab that we go to the graveyard all day. And then it's exceptionally, it's emphasized that the afternoon of Thursday between Asr and Maghrib to go and visit the graveyard. Uh, Saturday mornings is a time uh, that's recommended to go and to visit the graveyards in the morning time. And it's narrated that Bibi Zahra, salamullahi alayha, salli ala Muhammad used to visit her uncle Hazrat Hamza on Saturday mornings and she would go to his grave and spend time there and that's where we get the istihbab that Saturday mornings is a good time to visit the graves. Fridays, the time between tulu'in, tulu'in means the time from when Fajr starts to when the sun comes out is one of the recommended times on Friday to visit the graveyard. And then again, Fridays in the afternoon from Asr to Maghrib is recommended to visit the graveyard and to visit our relatives and the deceased people who are in the graveyard. Now, when we go to a grave to visit someone, there's also some recommendations of what you should recite when you go to visit the grave. Now, the same way with everything, there is an etiquette. There's an etiquette that when I want to visit someone's grave, how do I visit their grave? Amongst the recommendations is that when we go to a grave, we should face, sit, not stand at the grave facing Qibla. This is an important aspect that it's recommended that when we go, we should sit. So nowadays it's become much easier that Alhamdulillah, we can take a chair with us, we can take a, something to sit on with us, and we can sit comfortably by the grave. It's recommended that when I go to visit someone in the grave, that I sit by their grave, I place my hand on the grave, and the following is what's recommended that should be recited. That I should recite Surah Fatiha three times. And then Surah Nas and Falak, which are known as Ma'udhatain. Kul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, kul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, three times each. I should recite Ayatul Kursi three times. I should recite Surah Qadr seven times. And that if there's time that I should recite Surah Yasin once. But these are the recommended actions that when I sit by the grave of a person, that I should try to perform these actions. From amongst the other traditions that are present for us as a community, is that when a person dies, one of the recommended actions that has become a tradition in our cultures and in our communities is that if it's possible, we hire someone or we ourselves go and we recite the entire Qur'an sitting by the grave. This is one of the cultures that has established and it's been one that's been emphasized now for many, many years and something that if it's possible for us to do, whether we do it ourselves or we hire someone, that someone sits by the grave and recites the Qur'an and recites the Qur'an in its entirety with the thawab of the person. If I can't have someone sit there and do it, then the same way we do Qur'an Khani now, is that we gather people together or we gather people to, on, on the behalf of the deceased and we recite the Qur'an on their behalf. 
So these are among some of the recommended actions that if we can, we should make it a part of our practice and our habit to visit the graves. And when we visit the graves, we have the correct etiquette and behavior. Amongst other things that, for example, that when we go to the graveyard, it's not recommended to laugh when you're at the graveyard. It's not recommended to have worldly conversations when you're at the graveyard. It's recommended to remember our death, to remember those who have passed before us, to give salam to those who have passed away and to pray for their khair and afiyah in this way that if we perform these actions, inshallah someone will perform them for us. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Our discussion tonight is around our Prophet. Very briefly, our Prophet's life was a period of 63 years. The first 40 years were spent before the Annunciation and 23 years after the Annunciation. These 23 years are split into two sections. The first 13 years where the Prophet spent time in the city of Mecca and the final 10 years of his life that he spent in the city of Medina. Now, there's many interesting points to talk about the Prophet. There are many interesting things to talk about the Prophet. And we'll try to cover one really important area of understanding this life of our Prophet. But you'll have to bear with me because I get carried away. So if I start to tangent, you just have to you know, recite a salawat and we'll come back to the topic. Salla ala Muhammad. Muhammad. When we look at the 23 years, for example, the 23 years of his life where he was pronouncing and teaching the Qur'an. This 23 years, the first 13 years, if you look at majority of the verses that were revealed during this time period, were not about the ahkam and wajibat of fasting and praying. There were some of these, but the majority of these ahkam came in the last 10 years. The first 13 years and most of the verses that are associated with the city of Mecca are those verses that are associated with the aqidah, the philosophy, the spirituality of Islam and teaching people to recognize and believe that there is one Allah and no one else. And the second half in those 10 years, when our Prophet established Islam both as a religion and as a system of governance, was the time when the ahkam that were associated both with civil management as well as spiritual activity and individual responsibility were the ones that were presented collectively throughout this period of 10 years. The significance of all of this points to the importance and responsibility of how the Prophet established and laid the ground rules that people should understand. What was the purpose of Islam? Now the interesting question that we want to take a look at tonight and we'll answer a few of these questions is the understanding was that did our Prophet become a Prophet at the age of 40? Or did he announce his Prophethood at the age of 40? When we understand our Prophet, our Prophet is unique amongst all of the Anbiya. One, because he is Khatmi Martabat, he is the seal of the messengership, as well as the fact that he is the greatest of the Anbiya that was sent with his message that would last from the time of his revelation until the Day of Judgment. No other prophet's message has this period that what he prescribes for us stays until the day of judgment. Which is why the statement says, Halalu Muhammad halalu ila yawm al qiyamah wa haramu Muhammad haramu ila yawm al qiyamah. That which Rasulullah allowed will be allowed till the day of judgment and there's no change in it. And that which he forbade will be forbidden until the day of judgment and there will be no change in it. When we look at this and we try to understand, the first thing is to know that when this prophet was born on this earth, Allah changed the earth. The rules of this earth changed. The signs of his appearance were present in this earth from the moment of his birth. That, for example, the palaces of the, church, of the kings of Persia, their arches began to crack and these palaces that would never break began to break. The fires of the fire worshippers that had been running for a thousand years and more went out. The places where bodies of water were worshipped, those bodies of water disappeared. And other places where water never was, water appeared. Allah began the process of changing this earth so that in the earth, the signs of the coming of Rasulullah were present. To the extent where our Allah is the one who said, I have revealed rahmatul lil alameen on this earth. The mercy to the world has been revealed. Now from this day forward, O oh people, I give you the glad tidings that my punishment will not befall you until the day of judgment. If now we see that people perform many actions, 
that at one time Allah sent his azab on a people for those actions and we don't see the azab of Allah, it's because by the presence of the mercy to mankind, Allah has said, I hold off my hand from the punishment on people. There's even examples of this that talk about the responsibility, we can take it aside, you guys are okay? Yeah. All right. When Sheikh Al-Ansari, Rahmatullah Ali, when the marja before him became deceased, they came to Sheikh Al-Ansari and they said, you're now the marja. Sheikh Al-Ansari says, I don't want to be the marja. There used to be someone who I used to study with in my days as a student who now lives in Hilla. Go and make him the marja. He was smarter than me. Go make him the marja. They went to this Sheikh in Hilla. They went to him and they said that Sheikh Al-Ansari has told us that you're the marja, that you are smarter than he is. You are a better teacher than he is. This Sheikh said, it's true when Ansari and I studied together, I was better than him. But I left the Hawza 20 years ago. I have not been studying and teaching. The only one that you should make, the, the leader of the Hawza, the leader of the Muslimin, is Sheikh Al-Ansari. So they went back to Sheikh Al-Ansari and they said, Sheikh Al-Ansari, you're the marja. The other one has refused. Sheikh Al-Ansari says, I won't become marja unless if the imam himself appoints me. He says, I don't want this responsibility unless if the imam appoints me. So one day Sheikh Al-Ansari is teaching his class. And in those days, the class was you sat in front and everybody sat and listened. And in the back of the class, someone entered and waited for a moment and then said, Oh, Sheikh, I have a question for you. And the Sheikh said, Go ahead, ask. It was not uncommon that if a teacher is teaching a class and someone has a problem, they go to the teacher at that time and they ask. So in front of the students, this person stood up and said, I have a question. He says, What's your question? He says, What is the condition of a woman whose husband has been turned into a dog by the punishment of Allah? And Shaykh Al-Ansari says, he says it depends. If, for example, her husband was turned into a living dog, then she observes the idda of a divorcee. If her husband was turned into the statue of a dog, she observes the idda of a widow. But your question is moot, it's not possible. Because since the coming of Rahmatul Lil Alameen, Allah has held off His hand from issuing His punishment on anyone. So therefore, this is not physically possible in our time. So it's a question that has no practicality to it. The person says, thank you very much, Shaykh. Certainly you are the A'lam. You are the A'lam. Certainly you are the A'lam of the time and walks out. Shaykh Al-Ansari thinks for a minute and he says, go find that person who just left. They go outside and they say, Shaykh, he disappeared. We don't know where he went. He says, you don't know where he went because that was Sahib Al-Asri was Zaman. Hajjallallahu ta'ala faraj wa shari. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ala who placed the responsibility of being the marja on me now. In this way, even the example of Shaykh Al-Ansari points to the reality that Allah changed this world. That as long as now the mercy to mankind has been brought to this earth, that anyone and everyone has the opportunity to benefit from his mercy. And when we say that he's rahmatul lil alameen, mercy to all of mankind, some people question that how can he be the mercy to all of mankind? What if you don't follow the religion of Allah? What if you don't become a Muslim? How can it be a mercy for you? Well, this is one of the aspects that the azab of Allah was held off from you because of this mercy. Therefore, he is definitely the mercy to all of humanity, whether you believe in him or you don't. That the impact of Rasulullah was such. Now the question that comes, if Allah put signs in this world, that this world and everything within it was impacted by the coming of Rasulullah, how can it be that some Muslims come and say that this Prophet of Allah did not know he was a Prophet until the age of 40? There are people who say that no, he was just an average man, he did not know anything about anything, he was just someone who was just a normal person, and Allah out of the blue selected him and made him a Prophet. How is that possible? We disagree with this idea that the Prophet didn't know that he was a Prophet until the age of 40. We say that this is nonsense. If Allah can take someone like Isa salam and make him announce his nabuwa to the people from the cradle, Isa salam speaks in the cradle to announce to the people that he's a Prophet. If we were to say that Isa salam knew of his nabuwat and of his status as a prophet from the cradle and Nauzubillah, our prophet didn't know that he was a prophet until the age of 40, we would say that how could he be the leader of all of the Anbiya when he had no idea he was a prophet? The idea that Isa salam spoke in the cradle 
This mu'jiza was something important, by the way. You know this, right? Okay, let me explain this to you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. Ya Ali. If, if you get me started, we're going to keep going, okay? So as long as you, nobody falls asleep. The second one of you falls asleep, much is over, okay? Don't fall asleep. Why did Isa announce his Nabuwat from the cradle? If you take a look and you see, Bibi Maryam, when she gives birth to Isa salam, she leaves the city and comes back with a child. Now in that instance, when Maryam enters the town, the people say, Oh my God, you were a pious woman, your father was a good man, your mother was a good man. Maryam, how did you come back with a child? In that instance, anything that lady would have said, nobody would have believed. Anything that Maryam would have tried to defend herself with, no one would have believed. So Allah placed a miracle in Isa alayhi salam that in his infancy he spoke to show that this was a miracle of Allah and not an act of indecency on behalf of Bibi Maryam. There was no way to protect the honor of Maryam except that Allah chose this miracle to demonstrate and show the piety, the purity of Bibi Maryam alayhi salam. But to understand something, when Imam Ali was asked, who is greater, you or Isa? Imam Ali says, I am greater than Isa. Because when the time for the birth of Isa came, Jibra'il told Maryam, exit from this place, this is a house of worship, not a place to give birth. But when my mother wanted to give birth, Allah opened the Kaaba and said, come here, this is where Ali will be born. If the wasi of Rasulullah is greater than Isa, then how can you question if Rasulullah is greater than Isa? Meaning the status of Rasulullah is adeem. So how could it be possible that Rasulullah didn't know that he was a prophet? No, the prophet knows from the moment of his creation. When, for example, the Christian priests look at the back of Rasulullah as a child and they, they see the seal of Nabuat on him. When he possesses nur e Muhammad and the light of Nabuat is present in the face of Rasulullah, how could it be that he doesn't know that he is a Nabi from the beginning? It's known and it's proven that our Prophet was a Prophet from the very beginning. If Allah changed the world for him, then how could it be that he didn't know he was the side of Allah? So then what was the purpose of these 40 years? Why didn't he announce from the beginning? You see, Allah, when he placed a prophet in a nation, he made them into a relationship. He gave them a relationship. Lut alayhi salam was called that he was the brother of his people. Saleh was the companion of his people. Allah built relationships. When we take a look at, for example, even the life of Nabi Nuh, the life of Nabi Nuh, Allah in the Quran says that Nabi Nuh preached to his nation for 950 years. But the life of Nuh was over 2,500 years. It said that Nuh was a companion of his community for over 1,000 years before he announced to them the message of Allah. So that the people would know him and recognize him. In the same way, our Prophet, these 40 years were not something without purpose that Allah just decided one day that, okay, it's time. No, these 40 years of our Prophet's life were important to lay the foundation amongst the society to understand that the message of Allah is coming and who it will come from. These 40 years our Prophet spends in laying the example of being the best of character in society, the most trustworthy person in all of Makkah amongst the Quraysh was none other than our Prophet for these 40 years. Allah Himself in Surah Al Qalam in the fourth verse, when He says, Inna ka la ala khuluqin adim, that certainly you are on the best of moral characters. You have the greatest of morality and character of anyone, anyone, was the foundation to lay this fundamental of what is it that Islam wants from us. When we say that for 23 years our Prophet taught the religion of the Qur'an, he teaches in these 23 years the relationship that man has with Allah. In these first 40 years he lays down the fundamental of what is your character that you need to have to be able to have a relationship with Allah. Islam has two branches. One is the relationship between man and his creator. The other is the relationship between man and society. 
The fundamental of this relationship of man and society was established for 40 years before they were introduced to who is your Lord. And look at the importance of this time. Why? When the time comes for our Prophet to announce the message, our Prophet says to the people of Mecca, gather. And our Prophet was so trustworthy and honest that when he called society to come, everybody came. And they came to a mountain that is on the side or at the entrance of the city of Mecca. The mountain's name is Jabal, mountain of Abu Qubais. Behind this Abu Qubais was the road that led into the city of Mecca. When you were in the city, because the city of Mecca is a valley, you couldn't see over the mountain, but you knew that whoever was coming would come behind this mountain. So our Prophet gathered the entire city and stood on this mountain of Abu Qubais. And that's where he made his annunciation. And look at how he does his annunciation. He says to the people, he says when they gather together, he says, Oh people of Mecca, if I was to tell you that there was an army behind this mountain that was coming to attack you, would you believe me? I said, yes, absolutely we believe you. You're Al-Amin, you're As-Sadiq, you are the trustworthy one. We give our wealth and we put it in your care because we know that nothing will be lost from us if we hand it to you. We trust your word, you are a sadiq, the truthful, you never lie about anything. You are a sadiq, the most truthful. You are al-ameen, the most tr trustworthy in our society. So if you tell us there's an army coming behind this mountain, then we accept your word for it. Then Rasulullah turns to them and he says, then I am telling you that I am the messenger of Allah and I have been sent to you to guide you to the path of Allah. Here's the significance of this statement. And this is where it's, you guys are okay, you ready? Significance of this statement. The fact that for 40 years there was no one more truthful or trustworthy in the city of Mecca made it that the second our Prophet laid the statement that I am the Prophet of Allah, there was no one who could deny the truth of his statement. His authority of the religion of Islam, that he was the messenger of Allah, was a proof and a hujjah over the people from the second he announced it because there was no one who could be more truthful about his statement than our Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The importance of this, they didn't need to see a miracle. They didn't need to see anything else because the absolute proof was already established for 40 years that if this man says something, there is no doubting his word. Allah laid it that it wasn't that people had to take years of listening to the message to know, is this person telling the truth? Is he honest with us? Where did he come from? Is he a true follower? No, Allah laid the fundamental from the beginning that whenever this prophet will speak the message of Islam, that anyone who hears it from the first moment will know that the words out of his mouth are nothing but the truth. Allah didn't make it that, for example, maybe we'll believe him, maybe we won't, maybe he's telling... No, anyone who heard his message from the very beginning knew that only he could be the messenger and that no one else needed to authenticate his word because there was no one more truthful that they could ask about his honesty. This is one of the miracles of our Prophet. That he gave the most practical proof to know that certainly I am the one who is sent to guide you. Now, what does it mean when we say that our Prophet was on the best of character? And how do we know that he had the best of character? When we talk about this statement, you guys are okay? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There are certain attributes that a person can only possess and only know that we possess because we go through a difficulty. I'll give you an example. A man was doing tawaf of the Kaaba. And as he was doing tawaf of the Kaaba, it was in the time of the sixth Imam, he was raising his hands in du'a and saying, Ya Allah, i'tini bis sabr. Oh Allah, give me patience. Imam Sadiq, seeing this man, he taps him on the shoulder. And he says to him, he says, you are praying for bala. You're praying for difficulties in your life. The man says, huh? How? Imam Sadiq says, patience is the result of difficulties. 
to pray for patience is that Allah should give you that patience by you going through challenges and difficulties. If we look at two people who are standing together and are in exactly the same condition, we were asked which one of these two is the more patient of the other, we would say we can't tell. How do we know if they're patient? We won't know their patience until we see how do they handle a difficulty before them. How do they handle a trial and tribulation? It may be that the two of them in good condition are identical. When times are good, they're both giving, they're both generous, they're both kind to their families, they're both good members of society. But as soon as a difficulty befalls both of them, maybe their health is bad, maybe their children are sick, maybe they've lost their job, now we find out which one of them is patient. Which one of them continues to do good deeds? Which one of them continues to take care of his family and be kind? And which one of them stops all of the other good actions because he says, I'm going through difficulty, I can't handle this. This is how patience is established. So Imam Sadiq is teaching. He says, patience, when we make dua for patience, we are asking that Allah place trials on us. That's how we will develop our patience. So the man says, Ya Rasulullah, then what should I do? He says, pray to Allah, Rabbana a'atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Just pray that Allah give me goodness in dunya, don't give me tribulation in dunya. Ya Allah, give me goodness in akhirah, don't give me tribulation in akhirah. Give me so that I don't have to come to the tribulation to know if I'm patient or not patient. The same example now comes, how do we know that someone has good akhlaq? The idea of knowing if someone has good akhlaq, in good times everybody behaves well. Well, there's no problem, everybody's very nice. You find out the true character of a person is that how do they handle the difficulties and the problems. When our Prophet makes the statement, uh, when Allah makes a statement about Rasulullah and he says that you are on the best of akhlaq, it's because our Prophet went through trials and tribulations to demonstrate to society what was his akhlaq. That there was no one who could have faced the challenges that Rasulullah faced and still cared for the community and the people. Have you ever thought about the idea that the first 13 years of the messengership of our Prophet were spent in the city of Mecca and very few people accepted the religion of Islam and those who did were persecuted and that our Prophet was someone who was persecuted for those 13 years. He faced many difficulties he faced difficulties that where, for example, people would, we've seen, throw trash at him. We've seen that people, when he went on a journey to one of the neighboring towns, they refused him entry back into the town. He went through a period in his life where they, gave, they, they created a boycott against him. And he was cast out of the city of Mecca. And their businesses failed. And because of that boycott, his wife Bibi Khadija dies and Hazrat Abu Talib dies because of the sickness that they face. Our Prophet himself says, times have passed on me where I had nothing to eat but the leaves of trees. They tortured him so much. That the house of Abu Talib had the condition where the Prophet would not sleep in the same bed every night. Because the fear was that someone would come and assassinate him. Abu Talib had laid the fundamental that my sons every night, one of them will give their bed to Rasulullah. Such that he sleeps in a different bed that no assassin should know where he sleeps. 13 years he went through this. And then when he conquers the city of Mecca, when he takes authority over this land which tortured him for 13 years, have you ever noticed that he did it without killing anyone? He gave amnesty to every person that was in that city, with very few exceptions. He said, the people of Mecca, though they may have tortured me, they were responsible for my pain. They were responsible for difficulties, yet still I give them their life and I want them to be preserved. I don't want them to be killed. This is one of the examples of him being of the best of character. You see, we may go through difficulties, but if we are the followers of our Prophet, then we have to have good character. And the thing is that if we go through difficulties, most of the time the difficulties are because of conflict amongst ourselves. Yani a Muslim and a Muslim, a believer and a believer, there's conflict, there's some difficulty. And we imagine, how can I forgive someone after they have hurt me, after they've insulted me? How can I forgive someone after they've abused me in some way? Yet this prophet of ours, when Allah swears that he is the greatest of character, no matter how these people treated him, he forgave everything and allowed them their lives and to continue and not to suffer any loss.
The examples are even more extreme. Shall I share one example with you if you guys are good? You're good? All right. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa In a narration that's taught by one of my teachers, he says that at one time, Sayyidah Khadija comes looking for the Prophet in the city of Mecca and she finds him on the street gathering his own blood from the street. Someone had come and hit our Prophet that caused him to bleed and he was gathering his own blood from the street. And she says, Oh Prophet of Allah, what are you doing? What condition do I find you in? He says that they have made me bleed and I'm gathering this blood that it doesn't stay under the open sky. And she says, why? He says, because when the blood of the Anbiya is spilled and it comes under the open sky, it brings about the bala and the punishment of Allah on people. That I don't want these people to suffer from the difficulties of what will happen to them as a consequence of their actions. Therefore, I am gathering this blood that it doesn't land on this earth and bring on the punishment of Allah. This example is true, for example, even when we see the awsiya, when you hear the waqiyah of Karbala and you hear Aba Abdullah that at points in time when he was struck with an arrow or that his blood was pulled, you see him gather it in his hand and throw it to the heavens and nothing came back down. It was because the dua of Imam Hussein was not to punish and that the azab of Allah should come on these people at this time. Our Prophet was one who taught the society by this example to teach them that even though you may torture me, my goal is to educate you and guide you and I have mercy upon you in this situation. Our Prophet went through many difficulties, but one of the important lessons that we learned from this behavior is that he's telling us that good character is one of the fundamentals of your faith. Allah made me teach good character for 40 years before he made me teach these people about the message of Allah and how to worship Allah. Akhlaq, is one of the greatest responsibilities that a mu'min has. So why? We see the statements of the Ahlul Bayt. If there was a town of 10,000 people, and one other than our mu'min has character better than our mu'mineen, has the best character in this town, then the people in that town are not our followers. Many of the importance is, is that if you want to be known as a Muslim, you should be known as a Muslim through your character first, through your behavior with society and people and to be patient in the face of difficulties. There was no one, as we mentioned, who faced more difficulties than this Prophet, which is why he is the one who is on the greatest, greatest status of akhlaq that Allah swears by it. And he tells the people, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَيَتَّبِعُونِي يَحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ Allah is telling us that say, O Prophet, to these people, that if you want Allah to love you, if you love Allah, then follow me and then Allah will love you. The following of Rasulullah is in this akhlaq is where we know in society that we are following the example of our Prophet. That what is our behavior with people? What is our behavior in society? And our Prophet left us these Ahlul Bayt to ensure that we know the example of what it is that Allah wants from us in this world. Which is why we see even the verse in the Holy Quran, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali The famous ayah comes, right? قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ عَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى I don't ask for you any reward for this message that I have brought you except that you have love for my near ones. This isn't the only way that Allah gave the instruction for the people to follow the path of Rasulullah and to love the Ahlul Bayt. We see, for example, in Surah Furqan, verse number 57. Qul, ma as'alukum Our Prophet makes the statement, he says, I don't ask for you any reward for what I've brought to you, except one who wants to take the path directly to Allah. إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ يَتَّخِذَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ السَّبِيلَ who wants to follow the direction of how to reach Allah directly. In Dua Nudba, when we recite this verse, it says, وَهُمُسْ سَبِيلَ إِلَيْكَ That, O oh Allah, that these Ahlul Bayt were the path to reach you. 
That if we want to get closer to Allah, we follow these Ahlul Bayt. If now we commemorate all of these shahadats along with the shahadat of our Prophet, it's because when we get closer to them, they teach us the example of the character of Rasulullah. They teach us the, the, the deen of Rasulullah. They teach us the lifestyle and the seerah of Rasulullah and that they were the ones who were attached to him the closest and the ones that he told us to stay attached to. One of the greatest difficulties that befell our Prophet at the end of his life when he became sick and was getting close to his shahadat is known as the event of Thursday or the day of grief of Thursday. On this day when our Prophet found that his sickness had overcome him and he was coming close to the end of his time on this earth and the people were gathering and visiting him, he said to them, bring a pen and paper. I will tell you something that if you follow it, you will be preserved until the day of judgment, until you are returned to me. And the people that were present there, they refused. They said, the Qur'an is sufficient for us. Certainly he has lost his mind. Don't listen to him. That the people who had been taking guidance and hidayah from this man now suddenly turned on him and said that he has no sense, don't listen to him. What was it that our Prophet wanted to write for them? It was this hadith of Thaqalain. Inni ta'arakum fikum wa Thaqalain. Kitab Allahi wa itrati. That I am leaving amongst you these two weighty things, this book of Allah and my family. And these two shall not be separated until they return to me at the pond of Kotha. So whoever attaches themselves to these two things will certainly find success. But the people refused him this right. They said, no, the Qur'an is sufficient for us. We don't want anything that he has to say. We don't believe anything he has to say because their interest was, how do we steal this government, this kingship, this authority that he's established on this earth? And yet still our Prophet didn't curse these people. He didn't insult them. He said for them to leave him. He said for them to leave in this situation. And shortly after this, came the days of difficulty where our Prophet became closer and closer to death. Where they said that the only two people who would be with him would be Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima. His head would be in the lap of Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima would sit at his feet. He would come and go from consciousness. And in one of these instances, he called and he says, where are my children, Hassanan? Where is Hassan and Hussein?" And Imam Ali went and brought the two sons of Rasulullah. And when he brings the two sons of Rasulullah, they come running to Rasulullah and they attach themselves to the chest of Rasulullah. As they hug the chest of Rasulullah, his sickness overcomes him and he loses consciousness to where Amir al muminin says, maybe you are causing pain for your father Rasulullah. Don't be attached to his chest. Ya Amir al muminin what day were you thinking of? What chest were you thinking of that would be painful to have a weight on it? That you remove the grandsons of Rasulullah from his chest. When Rasulullah came to, he said, where are my Hassanan? Where are my two sons? Amir al muminin says, Ya Rasulullah, I was worried that it would be a discomfort for you. I was worried that the pressure on your chest would be painful. So I removed them from your chest, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah replied, Oh Ali, these two are my comfort. Don't you know that it was them? They said that Imam Hassan, whenever he would come close to Rasulullah as a child, Rasulullah would kiss his lips. And when Imam Hussein would come close to Rasulullah, he would kiss him all over the body. One day Sayyidah Zahra asked, Oh Abata, why do I see your behavior different that you kiss his lips, but you kiss him all over his body? He says, Oh my daughter Zahra, this Hassan of mine will be poisoned and these lips will be in pain for him. So I kiss him on the lips. She says, and what of Hussein? Oh daughter of mine, he will be covered in bruises and wounds. Therefore I kiss him all over his body. These two children of Rasulullah, they came by him and they sat by him and Rasulullah was comforted by their presence that in his final moments, he had Amir al muminin by him. He had Imam Hassan by him. He had Imam Hussein by him. And Sayyidah Zahra would sit by him. But all oh, that mercy upon the family of Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, once you were removed, once your shadow over them is removed, each of them will undergo difficulties alone without you. 
Each of them will call out alone that, Ya Rasulullah, where did you leave us? It's said that in this condition, as Sayyidah Zahra would sit by the feet of her father, a questioner came to knock at the door of the house of Sayyidah Zahra where Rasulullah was resting. She said, leave us, my father is resting, he is not feeling well. Again, a few moments later, the knocker came again. She says, I have told you already, my father is resting, he is not feeling well, do not disturb us. The third time when this questioner knocked, the voice of Sayyidah Zahra had emotion in it. Why do you not leave my father alone? Why won't you listen that he is not well? Why do you want to disturb my father? Have I not asked you to leave us? Hearing the emotion in the voice of Zahra, Rasulullah in his difficulty awakens and says, Oh my daughter, what disturbed you? Oh Rasulullah, today you cannot handle her disturbed. She says, Ya Rasulullah, O oh Abata, there is a questioner who keeps coming to the door and I keep telling him to let you rest, but he won't leave you alone. He says, O oh my daughter, the one who comes to your door in respect and knocks is none other than Malikul Maut, who because of the honor of your door, O Zahra, would not enter without your permission. This is that same door that Malikul Maut needs permission for, that soon they will come and they will break in such a way that the ribs of Zahra will be broken, the child of Zahra will be lost. Their wounds will be made from the nails of this very door. Rasulullah says, let this Malikul Maut enter. Malikul Maut enters and by the permission of Rasulullah, begins to take the soul of Rasulullah. He begins by pulling the soul from the feet, from the knees. When he reaches to the chest, as he's pulling the soul, Rasulullah says, oh Malikul Maut, stop for a moment. Has, have you pulled everyone's soul in such a painful way? Is death as painful as this for everyone? Is this how everyone experiences? Malikul Maut begs forgiveness. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I have never pulled a soul more gently than I am pulling your soul. In this moment, Rasulullah raises his hands. He makes dua, Ya Allah, Ummati, Ummati. Oh Allah, my nation, don't put them through this difficulty of a painful death. Ya Rasulullah, you're praying for that nation who will kill your children in ways that have not been seen before. In this condition, they said that sweat of death overcame his brow. His breathing became shallow. He, Imam Ali hugged him to his chest. The soul of Rasulullah left. Amir al muminin hugged him close to him. Ya Rasulullah, you have left us now. Our Prophet left this world in this condition. The guard over Ahlul Bayt left. Now there is nothing but Masaib on the house of Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, this Fatima of yours will cry soon. Subbat alayhi al Masaib. They poured such oppression on me, Ya Rasulullah. This Ali will be dead, dragged through the streets of Medina. Your Hassan, when they want to bury him next to you, they will shoot arrows at him. They will raise the head of your Hussein on a spear. إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون رضا بقضائه وتسليما لأمره With tears in our eyes by the wasila of our Prophet and rahmatul lil alameen we raise our hands in dua and call out ندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم Ten times Ya Allah 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 Ya Mahmud Bihakki Muhammad Ya A'la Bihakki Ali Ya Fatiru Samawat Bihakki Fatima Ya Muhsinu Bihakki Al Hassan Ya Qadim Al Ahsan Bihakki Al Hussein Ya Allah accept this small ibadat from us Ya Allah, give the thawab of this majlis to the marhumin of the sponsor of this majlis, the marhumin of all those who are present, and the marhumin of all those who are in need of dua. Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, cover our flaws. Ya Allah, keep our families, 
our children and our lineage on the upright religion of Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, we have gathered here with hajat by the rights of the mention of Rahmatullil Alameen. Fulfill the hajat of the mu'mineen. Give shifa'a to all those amongst our families, communities, and the mu'mineen who are sick. Ya Allah, remove the difficulties and provide safety to the muslimin and the mu'mineen wherever they are in this world. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the remainder of Zahra, the imam of our time. Keep us and our children from the supporters of Imam Zaban and entitle us to the shifa of Imam al Hussein in dunya and in akhirah. Matam al Hussein. के दुख से अभी आजाद कहां थी जैनाब हो गया कैसा गजब हो गया कैसा गजब बाप जिंदा न रहा भाई सुए खुल्द गया वाह सने सब्ज कबाब बेखता मार गया सिर्फ तेरा सूले दो सरा वाह सने सब्ज कबाब बेखता मार गया सिर्फ तेरा सूले दो सरा वाह सने सब्ज कबाब कर दिया जहर हलाहल ने जिगर के टुकड़े और कासिम के लिए और कासिम के लिए कम सीनी में यही गम शाम गरीबा जैसा वाह सने सब्ज कबा बेखता मार गया से पे रसूले दो सरा वाह सने सब्ज कबा बेखता मार गया से पे रसूले घर से एक बार जनाजा जो निकल जाता है कब वो फिर आता है कब वो फिर आता है ऐसा ताबूत है ये लौट के घर ओ आया वाह सने सब्ज कबाब बेखता मार गया सिर्फ तेरा सूले दो सरा वाह सने सब्ज कबाब बेखता मार गया सिर्फ तेरा सूले दो सरा शहने उस वक्त जो गाजी को न रोका होता अशर हो जाता बपा अशर हो जाता 
तीर आते न जनाजे पे तुम्हारे मौला वाहसन सब्ज कबाब खता मार गया से पे रसूल दूसरा वाहसन सब्ज का खता मार गया से पे रसूल दूसरा वाहसन सब्ज खबा शैकुर हान बरादर का जिगर याद आया जब सरे कर बो बला जब सरे कर बो बला टुकड़े खासिम के उठाते हुए मौला ने कहा वाहसन सब्ज कबा बेखता मार गया से पे रसूल दूसरा वाहसन सब्ज कबा बेखता मार गया से पे रसूल दूसरा अंधेर हुआ फातिमा जहरा ने कजा की अंधेर हुआ फातिमा जहरा खेती हुई बर्बाद रसूले दो सरा की अंधे हुआ फात कह कह के रो है जमाना या फातम के के जोरो या फातम कह कह के जोरो है जमाना तुरबत खिली जाती है रसूल दो सरा की सुनैन उठाए हुए हैं माँ का जनाजा हसने उठाए हुए हैं माँ का जनाजा हसनैन उठाए हुए हैं माँ का जनाजा और बेटियाँ कहती हैं दुहाई है खुदा की हाय बाजार के लोगों ने चढ़ा को भुजाया बाजार के लोगों ने चरा को भुजाया है बाजार के लोगों ने चरा गो को भुजाया मैया जो चली बिनते रसूल दो सरा की मैं आलम का उठा शब को जनाजा मासूम का उठा शब को जनाजा हाय मासूम आलम का उठा शब को जनाजा 
اس طرح سے شہزادی نے دنیا سے قضا کی محسن کی شہادت بہاں نہ تھا قضا کا محسن کی شہادت بہاں نہ تھا قضا کا اے محسن کی شہادت بہاں نہ تھا قضا کا اس طرح نبی زادی نے دنیا سے قضا کی اندھیر ہوا فاطمہ زہرا نے قضا کی اندھیر ہوا فاطمہ زہرا نے قضا کی لاؤ سین لاؤ سین مولا حق امام یا حسن یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین مولا حق امام یا حسن یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین یہ بیمار تھا وہ عبد چلنے سے وہ لاچار تھا اور شام کا بازار تھا اور شام کا بازار تھا اور مصطفیٰ کی بیٹیاں مولا حق امام یا حسن یا حسین یا حسن یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین شبیر کی وہ لادلی شبیر کی وہ لادلی سینے پہ جو شاک پلی سینے پہ جو شاک پلی جس کی عبابن میں جلی جس کی عبابن میں جلی مولا حق امام یا حسن یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین یا سے گلے خنجر تلے چادر لٹی خیمے جلے چادر لٹی خیمے جلے عباس کے پرچم تلے عباس کے پرچم چلے یہ بی بیاں مولا حق امام یا حسن یا حسین 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 اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و آل محمد بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکہ یا رسول اللہ السلام علیکہ یا نبی اللہ السلام علیکہ یا حبیب اللہ و خاتم النبیین السلام علیکہ امیر المؤمنین علی ابن عبی طالب السلام علیکی فاطمت الزہراء سیدت النساء العالمین السلام علیکہ حسن ابن علی المجتبہ السلام علیکہ ابا عبداللہ الحسین الشہید بکربنا السلام علیکہ یا ابا عبداللہ وعلا الارواح اللتی حلت بفنائک علیکم منی جمیعا سلام اللہ ابدا ما بقیت و بقی اللیل و النہار ولا جعله الله آخر الاہد منی لزیارتکم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته 
السلام علیک یا علی ابن الحسین زین العابدین السلام علیک یا محمد ابن علی باقر علم النبیین السلام علیک یا جعفر ابن محمد الصادق السلام علیک یا موسیٰ ابن جعفر الكاظم السلام علیک علی ابن موسیٰ الرضا السلام علیک محمد ابن علی الجواد السلام علیک یا علی ابن محمد الهادی السلام علیک یا حسن ابن علی الاسکری السلام علیك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب العصر والزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسحن الله تعالى مخرجك وظهورك وجعلنا من أعوانك والأنصارك والمستشهدين بين يديك السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد